uh, talk of the year yeah, for the right. Warren Wildlife yeah. Museum. I'm um, Eileen Lim, and I'm one of two museum workers that works here at the Warner. And tonight I'm going to be giving a presentation on problems pa pre past and present. Um, I'll talk a little bit about prehistoric pronghorns, um, a little bit about the build of the animal and the skeletal structure, um, a bit about the relationships pronghorns have with, have with Native Americans, uh, trappers, explorers that were coming across for the first time seeing them. Um, our pronghorns in the present, how we're dealing with them today, and then how we can keep them with us for centuries to come. So pronghorns. Pronghorns are the true Native Americans. They are the sole living survivors of a family of Antela Copperidae, an American group of servants that was once much more diverse than it currently is now. So their ancestors first appeared in the Middle Miocene. Uh, during the Middle Miocene epoch, around some 20 million years ago, there's a little arrow where they started. And in their numbers, uh, there, so, the Antelicopter in a range stratigraphically from the Middle Miocene to present day. And in their prime, their numbers and diversity of the pronghorn resemble that of the African antelope that we're surrounded here right now today. During the late Cenozoic, Antelicopters had around 12 genera that inhabited the plains of North America. And just like all of the African antelope that we're surrounded by, they had different horns, sorry, yeah, horns, different shaped horns, different sizes, different color variations. And you can see we have a little bit of artist rendition of a couple of them here. And they have some actual fossils and some more sculptures. We even had some that weren't. They have like the body of a person right next to them. Not very big. Little small guys, so just like all these guys here, every size and color variation. But of all this giant group of Antelicopteri, only one is still with us today, and that is Antelicopra americana. He's the sole living survivor of the Antelicopter. So if you think about it, you know, back in the day when there was such a giant plethora of different <coughs> pronghorn that it, it would have been just amazing to see all the different kinds but unfortunately we missed antelope at their dawn of their you know prime of their life when there was just an amazing variety some of them actually look like antlers like this dude up here or even like coral <laughs> but it's quite quite interesting creatures too bad we didn't get to see them <laughs> um, but this animal is built for speed. His skeletal structure is built for speed. And this actually perplexed a lot of uh, zoologists for quite some time because they just, like, why is this animal so fast? All of the animals that are the predators that are living in the habitat that it um, shares with, it's just leaving them in the dust. What is the deal with this animal? So finally, in the 60s, the aha moment came that the discovery of the Matter Synonyx, aka the American cheetah. Uh, this animal resembled very much the animal, the African cheetah. It had long, uh, flexible back and legs, and it was um, presumably just as fast as the African cheetah. So, we've got some artist renditions there of the Afri or the um, what would be the plains of the prairie cheetah. But thankfully for the pronghorn, but not so much for the, Afro, or the uh, American cheetah, the American cheetah became extinct around 11,000 years ago, so he's no longer with us, unfortunately. But even though that predator is gone for that animal, the pronghorn kept his speed. He's just as fast. So the pronghorn uh, is the fastest land animal in North America. Um, he can, his sprinting speeds can be from 55 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour. 
Um, they can sustain speeds for 45 miles an hour to 55 miles an hour. They can run for quite a few hours before they actually start to get tired, so they're good long distance runners. Um, a little information on the animal. They weigh between 75 pounds to 140 pounds, <coughs> the females being slightly lighter. And they, they're not really that tall. They, their height is about 2.7 to 3.5 feet from the foot to the shoulder. So they're not really that tall. I mean, I'm 5'3 on a good day, and they'd probably be face to face with me if I was standing in front of one. Um, to give a little context, an adult healthy mule deer goes about 160 to 165 pounds. So they are lighter. So the legs of the pronghorn are long and slender, and they're absent of the lateral digit. They do not have dew claws. And that's because if, when they're hauling across the plains, the last thing they need is a little tiny nubbin on their leg to get in the way. They're, you know, flying over uh, <coughs> outcrops and sagebrush and all this stuff that could just become a hazard of their little <coughs> dew claw. So it gets in the way, it could easily get ripped off, so they don't have any. Uh, the front hooves are larger and they uh, support the body and the weight as the animal is running <coughs> more. And, um, and they have, unlike deer, they have a very flexible spine, which helps when it's running, because if you think of like the way a uh, kangaroo is, when they're jumping, they kind of regenerate that energy. And his spine is like a spring, so he can just keep re regenerating that energy and <coughs> run for miles before he actually gets tired. Um, but, like a deer, they are absent of collarbones. So their front legs are have a really great range of motion because they're kind of just floating there in their muscle. So they don't have, they're not attached to their skeletal structure. And uh, so we got some pictures of them standing there, moving, running. The windpipe of a uh, pronghorn is uh, five inches in circumference, which is twice that size of a of a human trachea. So if I'm standing next to a pronghorn and we're both completely <coughs> calm, none of us are freaking out, um, he is actually bringing in or transporting four and a half times more oxygen than I am in the same period of time. So we're just sitting there, nothing making us scared. Um, pronghorns have much less body fat than other ungulates as well as their stomach is smaller. Um, so consequently, they carry less fat, bone, and gut contents, so they're lighter, less baggage to carry, so they can move faster across the plains. And with that large windpipe, which helps bring in that oxygen, which means they have very large lungs and a heart to help gather in great amounts of oxygen, um, oxygen-rich blood, delivering it to the muscles so they don't get fatigued as fast and they can run for miles. Um, let's see. The lung, or right, here's the lung. The eyes of the problem, you have that picture there, you can almost see 360 degrees as a couple examples here. So the predominant orbits of a problem horn are situated higher up and further back on the skull. So you can see right here, compared to a deer, how much different that is. Mm. That's kind of hard to see, but. So he's got a great range of view. He can see you for, I think, up to three miles. Before you can even see him, he can see you. He knows where you are. So you can take off before you even think about going over towards there. Um, and their fur, uh, is quite similar to that of a polar bear. Inside their fur is hollow air cells. So when it's really cold out, like our last, or this winter, where we had negative 32 degree weather, what they do is they kind of fluff up like a bird does, and their uh, hair layer stands up about two inches. And 
all that extra air inside of their hair acts as an insulation level area. And it's kind of like a um, down coat. And you have the little pockets of air with the down in, down in it. And um, the air radiates off his body and just gets trapped in that little layer. So it keeps him nice and cozy. Uh, in the summertime, when it's hot, or if he's running and he needs to cool down quicker, he lays that hair flat and it just dissipates off the body. So he doesn't get as hot that way. Um, when alerted to danger, this guy kind of is showing it, they contract their rump muscles so the hair on, the, on their butt kind of fluffs up like a cat's tail. And other pronghorn within a two mile radius can see that, and then they know that there's danger near and they have to be wary. They also exude like a musky odor, which uh, pronghorn within a mile radius can smell. So not only do they have great eyesight, they have great sense of smell. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are probably hunters. Chasing around pronghorn can be quite frustrating because they can smell you and see you. <laughs> You can never get that close to them. Now, the pronghorn, its characteristic name, the pronghorn, it is quite similar to a lot of these guys, as in it's made of the same material. It's just hard, compacted hair, keratin. So the same stuff that's in your hair and in your fingernails, it's just compacted hair with a hard, big nails type coating. Um, <coughs> just like all these guys. And just like these guys, the females also have horns, except they're smaller little spikes. They lack the interior prong or the cutter. But that's about it when it comes to the similarities to these horned animals. Uh, prong horn is the characteristic name. Their horn actually prongs, this guy's got two, from the um, original post, from a singular post. Kind of like a, you know, antler blue. None of these guys do. I looked to try to find any other animal in the world where their horn slits like this. Do you guys know if there is any? There's not. <laughs> These are the only guys. Um, there are other animals with multiple horns on their head. There is a sheep, a domestic sheep called the Jacob sheep, and their characteristic is they have four horns on their head, but they all come off the skull. In a different place. So, this guy's the only one that actually has a pronged horn. And unlike any of these guys, they actually shed their horn annually. Now, uh, you can find them, you can go uh, shed hunting around October and December to find some of these. Unfortunately, because they are made of hair, they do not last very long in the elements out on the prairie. When you find one, you'll probably be like, ugh, I don't want that. Because <laughs> it's falling apart, it's starting to disintegrate, and it's sometimes they get gross looking, and you're just like, no, I don't want that. But they do grow it back, and sometimes you can have funny looking ones, the non-typicals that have swirly horns and stuff, so it's kind of, and it is a sheath. It goes on to this uh, horn core, just like this guy here. And all these guys have horn cores in them as well. Not their specialty on that. Now, the dominant food for pronghorn is sagebrush, but they will eat other stuff, forbs, shrubs, grasses, plants. Um, but their main food is sagebrush. And even in the wintertime, around 80% of their diet compo is composed of sagebrush. And this is quite remarkable because there are a lot of sagebrush species that the essential oils in them are toxic to other ruminants and even toad ungulates. So your cows and your horses, um, sheep on the other hand, will compete with pronghorn because they'll eat every, everything just like the pronghorn. So they're kind of a different breed than that. Um, but having pronghorn around livestock is actually quite helpful because they will eat plants that are deadly and toxic to these animals. Uh, plants such as loco weed, greasewood, rabbit brush, larkspur, broom, snakeweed, and silvery lupin. These are all toxic to cows and horses. 
Um, and this is partly due because of their very large liver. And we all know the liver is for detoxifying, um, in their case, these plant compounds. So they're able to eat these um, native plants. And uh, sagebrush is a keystone species, so it's very important for them. If you take out these native uh, flora, then the native fauna will leave as well. So they're quite important together. So the relationship with Native Americans and trappers, as you can see Lewis Clark was saying, there's no animal um, ever yet to be known to the United States as the pronghorn, but little did he know this animal had been here quite longer than he had ever been there. But at the time, of course, <coughs> when these guys in 1804, the East Coast was basically the whole United States to them. They had no idea how big it was. You can see a map. I don't know if that looks that great, but uh, you can see the historical range and then the current range on there. And you got a little guy that has actually got a pronghorn. Well, lucky him. So I'm going to read some journal entries of some, uh, some of these guys that first saw some pronghorns. So the first conquistadors to record anything that interpreted as a reference to the pronghorn was Pedro de, de Castaneda, who created chronicled Coronado's search for Chibola, the mythical seven city of gold. In the early 1540s, Castaneda claimed to have been told by other Spaniards who had traveled through the region that flocks of goats had been seen, which ran very fast and disappeared very quickly. Nearly 250 years later, <coughs> the two missionaries traveling through what is now Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico saw some wild sheep that seemed to be larger and much swifter than a domestic sheep. Now, it's kind of funny, like historians going back and reading these journal entries must have finally clicked on them with all these, we don't know what this animal looks like. It looks like a goat or a African antelope or even a sheep, but it moves very quickly. So they were able to put together, oh, it must be the pronghorn that they're talking about because they had no idea what this was. <laughs> it moved too fast for them. Hurrah for the prairies and the swift antelope, wrote the pioneering naturalist John James Audubon on an expedition up the Missouri River in 1843. They fleet by the hunter like flashing meteors. They pass along, up or down the hill, or along the level plain with the same apparent ease, while so rapidly do their legs perform their graceful movements like the spokes of a fast returning wheel. We can hardly see them, but instead observe a gauzy or film-like appearance. So, you know, these guys, they're moving across the West, and by this time when they're seeing pronghorn, they're probably, you know, hungry, they need to restock their food. And they had seen deer before. Deer were not, you know, foreign to them. They know how to hunt deer. So the idea of trying to slowly, you know, send out a hunting party to creep up on these herds of pronghorn was impossible. It turned to be almost impossible for them to actually get them and get food. But, of course, with the Native Americans, uh, animals are extremely important to them. Any of the animals that they uh, shared the prairie with, and so were the antelope. And antelopes often played the role of messenger of plain Indian mythology. In some tribes, the appearance of an antelope in a settled human settlement had the meaning of a message from the spirit world, because they normally wouldn't get that close to a human settlement, so it would be like, oh, what was this animal doing? The Blackfeet tribe in Browning have a legend that tells how their god, Old Man, created the pronghorn on the slopes of the Rockies. But when he turned the animal loose, its great speed caused it to stumble and fall on the rocks of the fallen timber of the mountains. So, Old Man moved the pronghorn to the prairie, where it was content, and so was that, along with the bison, the pronghorn ruled the plains. And they did. Back then, when you had, you know, thousands of pronghorn and thousands of bison, it would have really been a sight to see. <laughs> Just an untouched world, almost. Um, now, because of their speed, uh, Native Americans kind of gave the 
they would see pronghorn as kind of arrogant in their way because they are so fast. Even their, you know, top Mustang could not even get close to these guys. So hunting them was very hard. But unfortunately for the pronghorn, they do have an Achilles heel, and that is their curiosity. Um, pronghorns display an enormous sense of curiosity, and it's quite uncommon in other wild communities how curious they are. They will investigate at any close range any strange or unfamiliar object, especially one in motion. Early Native Americans learned that you could lure a pronghorn into a close enough for bow and arrow hunting. If you hide behind a bush, waving a stick or a cloth, the pronghorn would come in close to investigate what the source was. And I don't know if any of you have heard when you go hunt pronghorn, some people talk about flagging. And it, it is a kind of a way of um, baiting or a deco decoy hunting. Um, I did look in the Game and Fish rules about hunting. Um, if flagging was okay in Wyoming and it doesn't have instruments, I'm assuming it is. I know in other states it is considered illegal just because their population is lower than Wyoming, so they don't want to make it as easy for you to go hunt them. But it's still a technique that hunters use today, flagging, because they are curious animals. <laughs> and um, a journal entry by Lewis, he was hanging out with the Shoshone Indians on, 14, on August 14th, 1805. A chief game amongst the Shoshone Indians is called the antelope. About 20 natives, mounted on their finest horses and armed with bows and arrows, catch sight of a herd of 10 antelope. They separate into little squads of two or three and forms a scattered circle around the herd about three or four uh, miles away at a weary distance. A small party would ride towards the herd with wonderful dexterity. The huntsman preserved his seat and the horse his footing as he ran at full speed over the hills, down the steep ravines, and along the borders of the precipice. This lasted about two hours and considerable part of the chase in view from my tent. About 1 a.m., the hunters returned, having not killed a single antelope, and their horses foaming with sweat. <laughs> it was just so frustrating. Just, you know, pronghorn are not like bison. You can't just run them off a cliff. They'll just dodge off and be done. Um, the last story I have, it's kind of one that I learned while I was working at the territorial prison. <laughs> and this is a kind of a relationship that a prisoner that was incarcerated at the penitentiary had with a pronghorn. So while he was there, of course, you got plenty of time on your hand, and over time, he slowly tamed a pronghorn. He'd go out, he'd ask the guards if he could go out beyond the gate to give his pronghorn some corn or some scratches. And one day, he saw his pronghorn out there, and he asked the guard if he could go out. And they were used to it by now, and they're like, all right, come back when you're done. Well. After a couple of minutes, hours, where did he go? He actually went out, saw his pronghorn, and then just kept walking. <laughs> he was uh, recaptured, but uh, that penitentiary was it's known for the escapees that got away in that prison. I think over 70% of the prisoners had escaped from that prison. So it was a little <clears throat> So present day pronghorns, so at the beginning of the 20th century, it was estimated a mere 1,900 pronghorn remained in Wyoming. That is very low. From almost the brink of extinction, they have recovered the population levels now between 300,000 to 400,000 animals. And that chart there is the whole United States. So it seems a lot, but it's all of them encompassed. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and this means uh, that so 300 and 400,000 animals statewide, that's Wyoming alone. So that means perhaps two thirds of the whole, all the world population is now found within, well, it says 300 mile radius of where we all stand, but we all know that that's much closer. If this was summertime, there would probably be some sitting up on the municipal golf course right now. 
We see them over at uh, Casper College. They should be the second, you know, uh, mascot for the school, honestly. But yes, Wyoming does have the largest pronghorn population in the world. It's followed by New Mexico, Colorado, Montana, and South Dakota. Um, South Dakota being fifth in pronghorn population with an estimated 47,700 animals, and that was recorded in 2017. So it's just a lot, but not as much. Now, pronghorns, they did kind of break them off into subspecies. Now, they all are Antilocopra americana, all of them. Um, in fact, if I didn't have the little names under those, you probably thought they were all taken here. <laughs> But um, like that map that I showed you earlier of the historic range, they were everywhere. But after a while, some of these groups kind of get pushed to the borders of their um, historic range and then they get completely isolated off. So they don't migrate that much. They migrate within their little area, but not too much. Not like the Wyoming pronghorn, which is the biggest group. Um, those are the ones you can see um, on the I-25 corridor from New Mexico all the way up to Canada, and then they split off in the states on the side. Then you have the Mexican and the Sonoran um, pronghorn, those are the you know, Mexican desert ones. The Oregon pronghorn was actually reintroduced to that area because it was completely <laughs> wiped out. And then you have the Baja, or peninsula uh, pronghorn, and actually in California, they do have uh, pronghorns in the zoo there, so <laughs> we're there. And you can see the Sonoran um, pronghorn is actually tagged, just because their population is so low, they are counting them. So, and they all look the same. They're all the same animal, but it's just where you find them. So it's not really, they're not really that different. They're just the different names for them. Where you find them. So the future of this. Current populations, of course, are affected by weather, extremes, droughts, uh, severe winters, harvest, or uh, um, poaching, because poachers do not care about conservation at all, and um, uh, disease, predation, uh, urban sprawl, livestock owners, and um, landowners that own like giant swaths of states almost, <laughs> so much land, and energy development. Now, uh, pronghorn uh, do get disease, unfortunately, but thankfully they do not get chronic wasting disease or brucellosis that does not jump to them, thankfully, um, because those are contagious. The diseases that they get are not contagious, thankfully. Um, they get blue tongue disease and epizootic hemorrhagic disease, or EHD. So the important factors of these, this disease, it's spread by bugs. So biting midges, uh, no see them gnats, that's that hang around water. So they go around there to get water and then get bit by these bugs that carry these diseases that get them sick. And then they act quite similar to an animal that has chronic wasting disease. They're confused, they lose, you know, fear of people walking in circles, just completely confused. Um, Parts of their brain will swell, their tongue swells, that's what the blue tongue name comes from. Uh, thankfully, uh, these bugs, it's just bugs, and they don't, like I said, um, it's not contagious, but, and also um, in the winter time, when all, there's a big freeze that kills all these bugs as well. Blue tongue, unfortunately, caused the death of 3,200 antelopes in Eastern Wyoming during the 1970s, late 70s, and an additional 384 die-offs due to EHD um, are a little bit harder to document because they're so similar to the um, blue tongue. But they have a feeling that a lot of them died um, in some western states and Canadian provinces because of that. And so the population of pronghorn uh, definitely affected by fences, um, railways, highways. I don't know if you guys remember the snowstorm in 2019 where we got close to four feet in town. So outside of town with those 
drifts, they're close to six feet tall, and this animal's not very tall, it's about three and a half feet from the shoulder, <laughs> so they get trapped in there with their little hooves. Um, that's easier for predators to get them because they can't run away. They get wet, their fur gets wet, and they get clumped with snow, which you know, can kill them because they get frozen. And, um, the, you know, and there's so much snow and you have nowhere to stand. <laughs> You're going to go to the places that are cleared, which unfortunately are the roads and the train tracks. And um, I do know that there was some pretty devastating losses that year because of the snow and vehicle strikes, train strikes. Um, there was a herd of 20 that was taken out by a train because they get into that corridor and they can't escape either side because there's so much snow. It's like you know, shooting fish in a barrel. And so in livestock fences, um, they're a universal feature to any prairie scene. And a lot of fences that are, if their bottom wire is too low, because um, unlike deer, pronghorn would rather climb under the fence. There is a picture of one jumping, they can jump. It's not that they can't jump, they just rather not. That one probably went miles before he was like, all right, I'll jump, <laughs> I'll finally get over it. But if it's too low, or if it's, the fence is built up with snow or trash, or, you know, uh, tumbleweeds, it makes it impossible for them to get through. Um, if you're a rancher and your uh, livestock is sheep, sheep will get through fences. They'll see them crawling under and be like, oh, they'll follow you. So they have the square fences for the sheep, and that's, they can't get through that. Um, but you can have wildlife friendly fences, like we have right there, with a little roller on it, or no uh, barbed wire. And if you raise up the bottom wire to 41 inches, they're able to crawl under it easily and continue their migration. You don't mean 41, you mean 14. Centimeters, you mean 41 centimeters. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, it, it still is, it keeps with the utility of the fence. Cattle and horses are not going to climb on your wires, but like I said, sheep will. Um, hunting is extremely important for the pronghorn. Um, you know, for conservation, if the animal is having a hard time, like it had for the last couple of years, they'll pull back on the licenses. Um, last year, 2022, the department cut 8,000 pronghorn licenses for that season. And for context, uh, in year 2021, around 31,965 pronghorns were harvested that year. And the post hunt population of pronghorn was around 300 and uh, 63,200 pronghorns for Wyoming, so that's not bad. And it helps them, you know, you can like ease up on the hunting of them and give them a break when they need it, because it was a hard year for them. This uh, 2019, 2020, or 2022, and then 2021. And they also have been having um, flare-ups of their disease to have been showing again, so that's unfortunate for them. I guess I just cruised through that pretty fast. <laughs> but do we have any questions at all about pronghorn? Yeah. When I'm looking at live animals from my car, I feel like I see a lot more pronghorns than deer. But when I'm counting dead animals lying on the road, I feel like I'm counting more deer than pronghorns. Uh, this is a long shot, but do you know why that is? Well, they, like I said, if they can't, especially the fence line that is running along the right by the interstate. Those are usually sheep fences, so that'll keep them back. They're not going to jump across that. But it's interesting you do say that because when you look at the deer that are always on the highway side of the fence, and then the pronghorns are always on the inside, of prairie side. And I don't know why that is. I think it's just because they don't want to jump it, and they can't get through it any other way. Uh, I was writing the human fish hole and he was talking about it. In the areas of the highways where there aren't antelope, you know, think about the Shirley Basin. 
Those fences are for cattle and they've got the bottom wire up 12, 14 inches. Right. The pronghorn can get under those fences anywhere they want so they don't panic. If you have a, your normal highway fence, which has a lower wire or is sheep tight, mm -hmm. but has a lower wire and they can't get under as well, then the pronghorn take and panic in front of the vehicle. Yeah. In Shirley Basin, which had very high concentration of animal, especially along the road there, they don't panic and get in front of the vehicles because they know they can get away. Yeah. But or if they feel trapped, they'll panic and then they'll get hit in places in the state that, where there's lots of animal being hit, it's there. Yeah. And it's just, it's it's a fencing problem with the it is, department. It's, it's, the, it's, yes. It's, Ranchers, um, I did forget to mention, ranchers, besides fences, they actually hold a really big, like, part of this pronghorn's, like, survival in their hands, because they own so much land. And especially besides fences, um, you get ranchers that come in, and they don't understand the sagebrush step. They don't understand the importance of native species. They come in and they tear it all out. They tear out all the sagebrush because they want more grass to grow. But what they're actually doing is they're taking healthy land and they're pretty much taking away its you know, immune system with all these native flora. And, you know, sagebrush is a keystone species. There's over a hundred species of animals and even plants that rely on sagebrush. Because sagebrush, their tap roots are so deep that they can bring up water to the plants that don't get it. So when landowners come in, they don't understand it. They rip out all the sagebrush, hoping that grass will grow. And then it's open to invasive species like cheatgrass. And we all know how horrible cheatgrass is. It's, no animal eats it. It goes to seed very fast and it's a fire hazard. And sagebrush is actually, you know, some of it is fireproof, some of it actually needs fire to spread its seeds, so it's very important to have. And any of you that have driven on the I-25 uh, corridor up through Colorado when you're coming up through the Front Range, notice how many pronghorn there are. There's not any. <laughs> I mean, even back in the 80s when the urban sprawl hasn't, hadn't come up so much, it's mostly ranching land, but there isn't that much sagebrush. Where there's no sagebrush, there's no problem. They will leave. <laughs> if you take away their food, they will leave. And you can see that. I mean, there's not that many in the Front Range at all. I mean, you cross the border and you get sagebrush and then you get pronghorn. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. But it, you know, they go together like peas and carrots. They're very important. Um, our next talk is um, March 16th, and it'll be on weed control by Matt Joseph. And that's extremely interesting, too. I went and saw his last talk. It's really, you wouldn't think he would know so much about weeds, but it would be interesting, and then you're like, oh my gosh. But you really walk away knowing a whole lot about it. All righty, I guess that's it. That was a fast talk. <laughs> but yeah, any other questions? What percentage of an antelope's diet is saved? Uh, well, in the winter, it's like I said, 80%, but in the summertime, they have other stuff. They'll eat grass, too. It's not as much, but it, it's <clears throat> so important that they will be around it. It's like they got to have it in their eyesight. <laughs> so, uh, a lot. Do you have any kind of relationship with the deer when I was hiking over? Squaw, it's on the west side of town, Squaw something, you know, right? and we saw a whole bunch of deer, and then just a little bit ahead of them, a whole bunch of pronghorns. Mm -hmm. like, do they like work together at all, or kind of? Uh, they just hang out together, <laughs> work together, but yeah, they're, just, they're usually in the same place, um, even though deer, deer are more of like a mountain creature or the base of a mountain type of thing. But uh, pronghorn, especially in the winter, will move closer to trees if they can. 
or down into valleys where they can get away from big drifts. So they kind of are in the same place. That answers my second question. What do they do when it snows? Because they're out on the plane in the step and yeah. <laughs> there's mostly they, bushes, right? Where do they go? Yeah, they try and go into like ravines and areas where they can get down away from it or closer to tree lines if they can. But they do move out of the town, I've noticed that. Although we do have a herd that goes through the back of the Warner every winter. They go through and they mess up all the snow and dig through to the grass at the bottom. So, very interesting. And it's funny because it's always in the winter time that they come through, and in the summertime it's the deer that come through. It's like they never are together. But yeah. There's a lot at the cemetery as well, right yeah. now. <laughs> and that's, that's really neat for, I mean, for us to be able to see an animal that some people will never see in their life just because they're so special to us, you know, especially in Wyoming, having the greatest population of them. And we could just go out in the backyard and see one, which is really, really neat. <laughs> Yeah. True story. Um, one day, uh, some people came into the Tate Museum, and uh, the lady, um, who was not from Wyoming, I could tell, she said, this is such a beautiful campus. I love the buildings and the grass, and I love all those statues of those, these, like, deer things. I don't know what they're supposed to be, but they're very mindful. That's, that, that's true, ma'am. Uh, try and pet one on the way out. <laughs> Quintessential Wyoming. They're, they look like Wyoming with their coloring, and they can handle this harsh weather, and they run like the wind. They're really impressive. And they're the, you know, there are a lot of paleontologists and other people like to give them the name as living fossils. They're the only ones that are left. They're quite important. You know. Without them, we, the prairie probably wouldn't be as as it is now. <coughs> Yeah. 